All right, I think we can get started. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the Eating Disorder Education and Awareness Program presented by the Missouri Eating Disorder Association, also called MOEDA. The Missouri Eating Disorder Association mission is to fight eating disorders, educate communities, and save lives. They are committed to providing information, resources, and advocacy that will change the conversation around eating disorders. They strive to bring understanding and support to those treating or affected by this devastating and serious disease. And I will let Lori and Rebecca take it away. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, my name is Lori Adams and I'm a certified eating disorder dietitian um, and an IADEP approved supervisor. And I am also a board certified specialist in sports dietetics and combine my practice for both of those in my outpatient practice. I'm also a MOETA board member. Um, I've been associated with MOETA since 2014 and have been a board member since 2018 and have been very involved in the Feed the Facts presentations, both at the community level, the professional level, and for the students. Now we'll go ahead and toss it over to Rebecca to introduce herself. Yeah, hi. So my name's Dr. Rebecca Fries. I'm the director of the St. Louis Behavior Medicine Institute Eating Disorder Program, and I'm very excited to be here tonight with Lori just to um, go over some facts about eating disorders, how they are treated, um, why detection and intervention is important, and also to help you identify or help someone who um, is struggling with an eating disorder. Um, there is going to be a lot of information tonight, and so um, if you have any uh, other questions, you can hold those off till the end, and also you can contact Moeda um, as well. And I will have the next slide, please. So what we're going to do is go through a little bit of what we like to call fact or myth. There are a lot of stereotypes out there about what eating disorders are and aren't. So we wanted to kind of start off before we get into some of the nitty gritty about what eating disorders um, are, what types there are, kind of their prevalence, but wanted to kind of go through a few different um, fact or myth statements. So we're not going to ask you guys to, you know, chime in or unmute yourself and chime in for the answers, but we'll run through these 10 questions and kind of think about what your answer might be. And then I'll go through a little bit of the information um, on each one of the questions. For number one, the question is, or the statement, I guess, is the most common type of eating disorder is anorexia. So whether or not you would think that is fact or myth. And in actuality, it's a myth. Um, most commonly, it is thought to be the most type, common type of eating disorder, but it's actually the least common eating disorder. Um, and binge eating disorder, which we'll talk about later, is actually the most common. Uh, statement number two, exercise is always healthy. And again, this is another myth. So really looking at exercise kind of falling on a pendulum and it can swing either way. So there are certainly health benefits of exercise, but anything when it is start to kind of fall into that unbalanced realm, then we would start to look at what that does to energy balance, what that does to injury risk, and what that does to mental health and mindset. And number three, eating disorders are about food. So again, we have another myth here. Um, eating disorders are really complex, uh, both medically and mental health wise, and really looking at there are a lot of other complex issues involved other than the food. The food may be the most apparent kind of thing on the surface, but really it's going to, to go much deeper than the food. Number four, someone with an eating disorder is at a low weight. So fact or myth, this is actually another myth. So a very common misconception is that you can like quote unquote see an eating disorder and what we really want to reinforce is that you don't have to be what would be considered a medically concerning low weight or a very emaciated appearance that you can actually be diagnosed with an eating disorder at any weight. Number five, women continue to be the most diagnosed with eating disorders. So this is actually our first fact. Um, women do continue to be the most diagnosed in terms of prevalence of eating disorders. But a lot of the research we'll go through and talk about 
um, really kind of look at increased diagnosis in both um, male populations and also transgender populations. Number six, socioeconomic status is not a factor in the prevalence of eating disorders. So again, this is a, another fact, um, often a common misconception that socioeconomic status being of higher or upper mid middle class would kind of tend to be more the stereotype that is found in the prevalence of an eating disorder, but really recognizing that having an awareness that an eating disorder can occur at any socioeconomic class, um, and it really does not identify based on race, gender, ethnicity, um, they really don't discriminate. So any socioeconomic status can be found to be a factor in the prevalence of eating disorders. And number seven, the fastest growing rates of eating disorders are not found in adolescent females. So this is also gonna be a fact. And even though it's thought that adolescent girls are the highest and fastest growing rate of eating disorders, it's actually seen in middle-aged females. Um, there's also increased rates in young children and also in um, children almost to the age of five. So we're really seeing a very diverse growing rate of eating disorder other than adolescent females. Uh, number eight, once an individual is weight restored, an eating disorder is cured. So this is a myth. Um, if it were that simple, our jobs would all be so much easier, um, and this wouldn't be such an awful illness um, and disorder to treat. So they're very complex, again, as I, as I mentioned, and from person to person, weight restoration might be one piece of the puzzle, but really that's only one part of the recovery process, and there's going to be a lot of underlying work that would be done aside from the weight restoration. Uh, number nine, someone needs to be below quote unquote ideal body weight to be considered malnourished. And this is going to be another myth. So again, kind of reinforcing that idea that you can't see somebody with an eating disorder. So there's not a particular look, there's not a particular weight that would be um, correlated to malnutrition. So really anybody at any weight could still be diagnosed with malnutrition and with an eating disorder. And finally, number 10, eating disorders are a choice. And this one is also a myth. So eating disorders are not a choice. Um, the recovery process is a choice and somebody has to be very ready to, to really dig in and work on their recovery. Um, but eating disorders are very complex and they're not a choice just as the same as nobody can really be the one single cause. There's no one single cause, it's not a choice. Um, I've never had a client say that they've chosen to have an eating disorder. So I think it's really important to know that this isn't something that somebody ever chooses for themselves, nor is it something that somebody can kind of put upon someone else. Uh, next slide. So what we're going to do um, next is go through a few of the different types of eating disorders. So we're going to go through five of them that are most notable um, and classified based on something called the DSM-5. So this is essentially just the way they would diagnose eating disorders. So we're going to give a brief overview of each just in the essence of time. But you can definitely go to our website at moeatingdisorders.org. Um, we'll try to go ahead and put that up in the chat box. And if you need additional information, you can find that there. Next slide. And the first one we're going to talk about is anorexia. So with anorexia nervosa, <clears throat> this is the diagnosis I think most people tend to think about when they hear the term eating disorder. Um, and actually based on the factor myth quiz we just did, learning that it's the least common is often a shock to people. Um, it's actually the third most prevalent um, condition among adolescents. And with that, really looking at it being defined by the body, essentially not being able to take in enough nutrition um, to function normally. So this can be through restriction of food. It can also be through the restriction of fluids. Um, and food can be both calorically and it can also be a restriction of the types of foods the quantity of foods, the frequency of food. Um, and all of this is with a very 
intentional um, desire to want to lose weight or to prevent weight gain. So this is a very hallmark sign of anorexia is really the focus around the fear of weight gain, um, a lot of distortion around body image, a lot of negativity around body image, and really kind of seeing that weight as the overall value of self-worth. So seeing that, um, that distortion and having a lot of negative um, image around their own value, their own self-worth, and then really not being able to see the severity of the disease. So a lot of denial of how bad the condition is, minimization of what the dangers of the disorder are. Um, and there will classically be two types of anorexia. So the first being restricting type, which is going to be a limitation of calories and may also be a use of exercise to burn calories. So essentially trying to restrict intake to the lowest possible amount. And then the second type is going to be binge purge type, which will involve some binge eating um, and purging, which we'll talk about in some of the next slides. Um, the difference with this one from bulimia, which we'll talk about, is that there's still the underlying value of kind of the weight loss and the fear of weight gain. Um, and that would really kind of be the separator on that. So I will go to the next slide for Rebecca to talk about bulimia. So bulimia nervosa is a cycle of binging and compensatory behavior such as vomiting um, designed to undo or compensate for the effects of binge eating. So it often is um, a time when someone is feeling very out of control and they experience a lot of shame, guilt, and self-hate based on both behaviors, both the binge and the purging. Oftentimes they have a very distorted view of their body and they have an obsessive desire to lose weight. <clears throat> so as you can see here, there are several facts that uh, point out that uh, bulimia nervosa is um, very um, concerning. 7% of the US females have bulimia in their lifetime and are often undiagnosed or studies um, don't show that they are diagnosed as frequently. There was a study that um, showed 90 uh, children and adolescents aged 7 to 18 who were diagnosed with bulimia nervosa, who also had a high prevalence rate of suicide. So that often correlates with um, bulimia nervosa as well. Next slide. Looking at binge eating disorder. So this is a newer um, diagnosis based on the DSM-5 was actually just introduced and formally classified back in 2013. And despite kind of the newness of the classification, it's the most commonly diagnosed eating disorder. So to the point where it's at a rate of three times that of anorexia and bulimia combined. Um, so really seeing a high prevalence out there in, um, in the community of binge eating disorder. And it's really kind of characterized by the cycles of binging, so similar to what Rebecca just described in bulimia, however, there's not going to be a use of any compensatory behaviors. Um, still a lot of the hallmark symptoms of feeling a lack of control when eating, feeling a lot of shame and guilt. There can also be a lot of withdrawal from family and friends, a lot of isolation that occurs with this disorder. Um, and really looking that they find that it often occurs and starts in the late teen years to the early 20 years. And this is one where they're seeing a higher rate in kind of male to female ratios. So most of the study is looking at about 40% of those diagnosed with binge eating disorder being um, male to female. And then a lot of overlap among different genders and ethnicities as well. Next slide. So one um, disorder called avoidant restrictive food intake disorder of, or ARFID is very similar to anorexia in that both disorders involve limitations in the amount of food or types of food that they're consumed. However, unlike anorexia, ARFID does not um, involve any distress about body shape and size or fears of fatness Rather, it's characterized by aversion of certain foods, 
fear of vomiting or choking on foods. So oftentimes this disorder starts um, at a young age. So many children go through this phase of being picky or selective, but a person with ARFID does not just consume enough calories. They're not consuming enough calories to grow and develop properly. And um, in adults, it can lead to having difficulties with their body functioning properly. So there was a study um, done on a group of adolescents with this particular eating disorder. Um, they were receiving um, treatment in a specialty clinic. 14% of them met the criteria for ARFID. So ARFID um, is often diagnosed more in the younger aged um, population. However, it can be um, diagnosed in the adult population. And oftentimes, um, nearly half in some studies, children report that they have a fear of vomiting or choking or that they have that aversion to food. So it's about sensory issues and things of that nature that um, you wanna also be looking for. Next slide. And then our fifth category of eating disorders that we're going to touch on is a classification called ASFED or other specified feeding and eating disorders. You'll kind of notice a lot of acronyms in here makes it a little bit easier <laughs> in the world of eating yeah. disorder treatment. So ASFED is going to be um, not to minimize it, but kind of a catch all um, of eating disorder criteria. So when I say not to minimize, it's really important to recognize that a lot of individuals that are diagnosed with ASFED versus anorexia or bulimia or binge eating disorder often feel that their eating disorder isn't good enough or that they're not sick enough, that their eating disorder is not good enough or they're not sick enough to deserve treatment. And it's really important to recognize that of individuals seeking treatment, about 30% of them are actually diagnosed with ASFED. So it's really looking at, there might be one piece of the criteria that doesn't meet, meet the full criteria for anorexia. Uh, so one example of this can be atypical anorexia where the weight may not meet the significant weight loss or being significantly below um, one's ideal body weight. And that can be something that would kind of classify under um, ASFED. There's also a couple of conditions, um, one being diabulimia. So with individuals with type one diabetes, um, there's a very high correlation of eating disorder crossover and seeing that there would potentially be a misuse of insulin um, to manipulate blood sugar control and essentially weight and the absorption of nutrition. And another one is called orthorexia, which we'll talk about um, in a few slides. Next slide. So how you can conceptualize the development of an eating disorder often is described through the lens of the biopsychosocial model of health. This framework depicts the interactions between biological, psychological, and social factors that determine the cause, manifestation, and often the outcome of wellness from a disease. So let's take a look at this a little bit more closely. Next slide. Here's what we know. We know that individuals with eating disorders are predisposed biologically, so their genetic makeup, and then the environment often swoops in and that's what prompts the eating disorder to become active. There are certain personality, um, <clears throat> personality, excuse me, which leave individuals more vulnerable to their environment and get them stuck in that kind of dieting yo-yo or other aggressive measures to lose weight. Often personalities seeking ways to measure their self-worth or value lead to vulnerabilities to an eating disorder. And while other individuals have some biological underpinnings that make them more prone to getting sick very fast when they're engaging in restrictive and binging behaviors, research does suggest that all of these traits are at least partially driven by genetics and then those features obviously leave them predisposed to other um, illnesses such as anxiety, depression, perfectionistic tendencies, or being self-critical. And then in all of that combination, those can contribute to people wanting to manage their weight 
through unhealthy patterns and then develop eating disorders. So while we don't know exactly how to pinpoint what mechanism, what personality trait, what genetic um, component is actually leading to the eating disorder, it is useful to understand that there's a biological underpending. Next slide. So there's also risk factors that leave you more vulnerable to an eating disorder. And remember, risk factors are not necessarily pointing you to that person has an eating disorder. What it really is saying is that it leaves someone more vulnerable to the development of certain illnesses or, in this case, an eating disorder. So it can be a... Um, it can be various things. Um, it can be family history of an eating disorder, having an illness such as um, type 1 diabetes, um, difficulty maybe having um, transitions, going from one school to another school, or going from college to employment, or things of that nature. So significant losses, deaths, all of those things don't necessarily mean that somebody is going to develop an eating disorder, but it can mean it leaves them more at risk of developing an eating disorder. Next slide. So in that framework, we also saw not only biology, but we also saw that there's environmental stressors and triggers that can also leave somebody predisposed to being um, more vulnerable to an eating disorder. And environmental factors are really important to um, be aware of. So people who are experiencing um, bullying, there's sports pressures, maybe from a coach or from other peers. You can have difficulty in your career or even looking for a job. And sometimes it can even be food scarcity. So not having enough food available to you um, or a lack of structure in your day where you don't have the opportunity to eat meals or snacks. You could have a food, a food insecurity. You could have um, experienced trauma. All of those environmental risk factors also leave one more susceptible to developing, to developing an eating disorder. Next slide. So here is my one environmental uh, stressor that I think is predominantly normed in our culture. It's fun and it's entertaining and you may even be someone who engages in a lot of social media. However, inundation of pictures and messages of unrealistic and unattainable bodies increase the prevalence of a negative body image, and then body shaming begins, and this perpetuates the diet culture. So there's a lot that goes into our consumption of social media that we might not be thinking about and has pretty detrimental um, impacts on individuals. Um, some facts are that, um, and I think these are really um, helpful to know, is up to 25% of 11-year-olds have already made one diet attempt, and the average diet starts in girls age 12 to 13. And on a typical day, anyone from the age of 8 to 18 are engaging with some sort of media up to about seven and a half hours per day. So we are actually consuming a lot of social media messages. Only 5% of American girls actually have the body type portrayed in these images, like on Facebook or TikTok or things of that nature. 47% of, of um, girls in grades 5 through 12 report wanting to lose weight because of the pictures that they are seeing in social media. And almost half of American children between first to third grade want to be thinner, reporting wanting to be thinner, and half of nine to 10 year old girls are dieting. So this is a issue that is becoming more and more complicated based on their access to social media. Next slide. And as Rebecca was just mentioning, there's a lot of tie-in between social media and diet culture. So there's a lot of what we would call diet culture, kind of consisting of the, the dieting beliefs and messages, also the thin ideal that is um, a very uh, prevalent um, 
belief or stereotype. Um, the idea that there has to be a certain look um, that individuals are aspiring to be. And really looking at dieting as one of the single most impactful predictors of an eating disorder. So when we live in a, in a society where there's so much dieting that's normalized, and unfortunately from a very early age is a very learned behavior, it's very normal to kind of grow up in, in that messaging, whether or not it's your own household, it's at school, it's at work. Um, it, it really, if you think about it, it's everywhere. Um, the unfortunate reality of this is 95% of diets don't work. So what that means is the weight that is lost on a diet is typically regained within one to five years. Um, and typically that will even be additional and leads to a cycle of what would be considered yo-yo dieting. And as that occurs, the, the more extreme the diet becomes, the more likely an eating disorder is to develop. So what they found in one study is um, with some dieting behaviors that teens were five times more likely to develop an eating disorder, but with more severe and extreme dieting behaviors, that percentage or that likelihood went up to 18 times more likely. So really seeing the jump that the more frequently or the more intensely one engages in diet behavior, the higher the propensity to development of an eating disorder. Um, there's also a higher frequency of binge eating from those individuals that are dieting. So what they find is kind of that deprivation from the dieting can set into more of those binge cycles. Um, so this might be where we would see some of the bulimia diagnosis or binge eating diagnosis or ASFED. And <clears throat> one of the things that's been really difficult looking at the last year or so is with social media, with everybody being kind of cooped up at home, there's a lot of negativity out there on social media about, you know, the quarantine 15 and the COVID diets and the importance of doing workouts. Um, a lot of, you know, on Instagram and TikTok and things like that, that not only young individuals, but, um, even, you know, adults through their 20s, 30s, 40s are finding themselves in this diet culture um, and finding themselves vulnerable. So I think the other thing with diet culture to really look at is it's starting to get a little trickier to really identify what is a diet. It's almost wrapped up into what would be called like wellness and lifestyle. So looking at some of the things that might trigger anything that's essentially going to start restricting intake, whether it's types of food, quantity of food, frequency of food, putting limitations on times, putting limitations on amounts, kind of the what, when, and who with type of situations. Um, one thing that's important to, to note, I know there's a lot of emphasis on, um, and I, I don't like to use the obesity word, however, it is one that's in the medical community. With the war on obesity, a lot of shift is starting to occur. So looking at the American Academy of Pediatrics, they're now discouraging any kind of dieting or weight loss in children and adolescents that focus on weight or body dissatisfaction. So there is some reassuring um, progress being made, but there's still a long way to go and really looking at how diets impact us. Um, next slide, we'll actually talk a little bit about a term that's, um, that's out there called orthorexia. And most people might recognize this a bit better as the idea of clean eating or even defined as healthy eating. So again, this is one of those situations where diet culture or dieting is kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing. People don't necessarily think of it as something that can be harmful or kind of, you know, looking at genetics will load the gun and dieting will pull the trigger. Um, so this isn't a diagnosable eating disorder. It's a term that was defined in 96 by Dr. Bratman. And it's really an unhealthy obsession with what would otherwise be termed healthy eating. So there's a lot of classification of good foods and bad foods clean foods, um, a lot of emphasis on the purity of food choices. So this might tie into organic, 
non-GMO, no additives, um, no dyes, basically kind of thinking no, no, no. Um, and a lot of times it really kind of comes down to a, a lot of intense label reading, um, looking at nutrition facts labels, and a lot of times can be misguided. So I recently heard a commercial and had to kind of laugh at it, but it was kind of going through the ingredient label list and pointing out like, oh, cyan and cabalamin, who would eat that? Really what the average person doesn't know is that cy cyanocobalamin is actually vitamin B12. So it's really a very scientific name for a vitamin. Um, so when you kind of look at those, a lot of this starts to get very rigid in terms of food styles and food behaviors with a lot of, I shouldn't, I can't, I wouldn't, I won't, um, and really starts to kind of become very socially isolating, not being able to go out with friends, being fearful of when um, there are meals out that that becomes a very stressful environment. Next slide. So then tying into this is weight bias. Um, and we have a lot of weight stigma in society at large. And when we start looking at the weight biases, there are ways that you can really look at taking an inward look to figure out how to help with this. Um, so statistically, when you look at someone with an eating disorder, um, only less than 6% are actually medically considered what would be defined as underweight. So again, this reinforces the idea that you can't see an eating disorder. Um, and then people that would be considered to be in larger bodies are not as frequently diagnosed. So whether they're seeing healthcare providers that aren't familiar with eating disorders or not being appropriately screened, a lot of individuals are being missed because there's a stereotype um, in the medical community and in society at large that unless you are, you know, visibly quote unquote underweight that you wouldn't be struggling with an eating disorder. Um, so really being able to recognize how, <clears throat> how that plays a role in people being able to access treatment and seek out resources. Uh, you can, if you are looking at how to help um, individuals that are struggling, is really kind of looking at your own bias. Um, there's a really easy uh, quiz, I guess you could say. So they're called the Harvard Implicit Bias Tests. And you can go online and take one that is specific to weight. And it really kind of shows you where you are on the weight bias contingent or continuum. Um, the other thing you can consider is in general, not talking about body or weight. So I think one of the messages we've tried to make clear is you can't tell who's struggling with an eating disorder. So not knowing if it's a coworker, if it's a colleague, if it's a friend, um, oftentimes eating disorders aren't things that people will talk about very openly unless they feel comfortable with that. So really knowing that talking about diets, talking about body weight, talking about body size, body shaming, et cetera, can be very triggering for somebody with an eating disorder or to the development of an eating disorder. Um, and a couple of things that you can, you know, do to educate yourself, there are um, movements around health at every size and intuitive eating. So those are two concepts that are more encompassing of different size bodies and looking at how to listen to more internal cues to eat and to feed yourself as opposed to, um, as opposed to diet culture. Next slide. So some of the statistics really looking at um, the skew of the population on a whole. One of the most impactful number, numbers is probably four out of 10 people um, have experienced an eating disorder or know someone that has. So if you start thinking about family, friends, et cetera, that really starts to kind of put in perspective how prevalent eating disorders are. Um, there are much higher increasing rates of eating disorders being identified, as I mentioned earlier, in younger children, also in males, um, BIPOC communities, and also those with a history in terms of adolescence, a history of obesity. Um, 
there's also a very high prevalence of teens in general looking at dieting. It's really looking at about a half of teenage girls, third of teenage boys using unhealthy weight control measures. Um, and really those that are even what we would consider subclinical problems, meaning they don't quite fit the criteria for a full diagnostic eating disorder are even still at greater risk for both um, the physical and the mental aspects and the impact into early adulthood. Next slide. One of the biggest things we can look at in treating eating disorders is early intervention. Um, so ideally, if an eating disorder is identified very early, um, the prognosis is much better if it is treated very quickly and very aggressively. So the young adolescents, when it's caught um, over the, you know, over time, the majority of them do have better recovery outcomes than an individual that has been living for a long period of time with their eating disorder that has not been identified or treated. That becomes much, um, much harder to treat and much harder to recover from. And really, um, we'll kind of touch into this um, in the next portion, but the mortality rate becomes much higher. Um, and even mortality rate for the longer somebody has an eating disorder, the, the higher their individual risk becomes. So not only we're we looking at it higher collectively, but higher for each individual person. Next slide. So real briefly, we want to um, just highlight a few uh, statistics and facts. Every 52 minutes, someone dies as a direct result from an eating disorder. And anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa have the second highest mortality rate of all psychiatric disorders. And so while we often will see people or hear of people being diagnosed with depression, anxiety, or bipolar disorder, we actually have eating disorders as a high mortality rate for all the psychiatric disorders. And in that, up to 20% of individuals with an eating disorder die of medical complications of suicide. Um, so a mortality rate as high as 45% in severe cases. What I think is important about all of these numbers and what we're saying is that even though you may believe that you don't know anyone um, who has had an eating disorder, the possibility of you knowing someone or knowing someone who has died from an eating disorder is actually a little bit higher than one might think. Next slide. So one uh, specific subgroup is looking at males and a lot of um, studies are estimating that the prevalence can be as high as 25 to 30%. It's currently estimated about 15%, but the prediction is that the incidence is much higher. A lot of this is thought to be, again, the stigma that's associated with eating disorders being a primary female in, uh, disorder is that there's less of a, a less of a, a um, <clears throat> words have escaped me, um, kind of less ability to reach out for help and assistance. Um, there's also a significant difference in terms of how an eating disorder might present in the male population. So a lot of it, um, for females, there's a lot of reinforcement of the thin ideal versus the male kind of body image focus is going to be more muscular and lean ideal. Um, so this is going to be something that can impact um, self-esteem, their body image, and really kind of look at um, different behaviors as well in terms of compulsive exercise, maybe using steroids or other um, like muscle enhancing agents that might be of use. So that's one aspect where they might be suffering with an eating disorder and not being identified. Um, and the other piece is looking at <clears throat> the mortality rate in males um, is estimated to be higher than in females. So again, looking at is that a correlation with not receiving treatment early on and, and kind of having the eating disorder for a longer period of time, which we know based on previous studies with females that that individual mortality risk is higher if it is not treated. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So as Lori was mentioning, you know, oftentimes in social media or other areas where you get the news, women, girls are portrayed as being ones who suffer from eating disorders, which actually, as you are learning, is a, a little bit far from the truth. So other people are experiencing symptoms and suffering from eating disorders. One um, particular group of folks um, in the LGBTQ community community in particular have very unique challenges that may put them at risk of developing eating disorders. Often they are experiencing rejection, discrimination by friends, families, and communities. They experience higher rates of violence and homelessness. They also are receiving messages or internalizing messages that, um, is, that impacts their um, thought about themselves that leave them more vulnerable to mental health concerns. And there is also a lack of culturally competent treatment, lack of support from families and friends, and insufficient eating disorder education available, leaving them either undiagnosed or untreated. So if you look here at some of the facts that um, we have presented to you tonight, gay males are seven times more likely to report binging and 12 times more likely to report purging than their heterosexual counterparts. Um, transgender youth are four times more likely to suffer from an eating disorder and twice as likely to engage in purging. And oftentimes we might find that food restriction and compensatory behaviors such as vomiting are possibly used to cope with gender related stress and used to interrupt the developmental stages of their body. Next slide. So again, kind of looking at different demographics, when we look at the BIPOC community, um, really looking at essentially a failure to diagnose. Um, when you look at the, the statistics of diagnosing, um, it's about 50% less likely from a diagnostic standpoint or from receiving treatment. Um, and again, this is, you know, kind of a work in progress to figure out is this um, a lack of screening? Is this a lack of resources that are available? Is it available treatment in the area? Um, and when we look at behaviorally, so looking at black teens compared to white teens, we're about 50% more likely to engage in binge and purge behaviors. Um, this is also true of the, the Latino population. So really looking at a higher propensity to suffer with bulimia and avert bulimia nervosa than um, say their, their counterparts um, of non-Hispanic descent. And also looking at just an overall trend that's reflecting a higher prevalence of binge eating disorder across all minority groups is what's been suggested in the research. Um, one kind of contrary to that is more the Asian American population group really looking at higher rates of restriction and more body dissatisfaction and negative att attitudes towards obesity or of those in a higher weight body. So you can kind of almost see even different um, behavioral and beliefs and attitudes um, through eating disorders coming out in different populations. Next slide. <clears throat> So as you can see, there are many stereotypes that feed into society's perception of, of who is affected by an eating disorder. And one population that's overlooked often is the middle age to older adult population. Sometimes those individuals have even been suffering longer with an eating disorder, sometimes for decades. Um, I often will hear this old myth, and we talked about it earlier, that we can grow out of an eating disorder, which of course we know is far from the truth. But what that does is it shifts the focus onto individuals who are younger or um, like young adults or children. And then often um, the middle age to older adults are overlooked or underdiagnosed or undertreated. Um, so because there's many reasons, but one of those could be um, symptoms are often mistaken for other illnesses that are directly related to aging, like hair loss or bowel issues. Um, behaviors may be misidentified as stress or assumed to be some other type of health condition. So I think the important part, and I know Lori and I both agree with 
that this is um, something we want people to understand is that eating disorders do not discriminate by race, culture, gender, age, and it's crucial in order to be able to help people and for those people to receive support to be more aware that these um, issues are being experienced by many people. Next slide. So here's a little slide about do's and don'ts. And so it's really about how can you help. Um, so we don't want to tell somebody who's underweight um, that they're lucky to be thin. Rather, it's really important to be able to be there and support them, but also complimenting somebody just on their bodily features is also it just can be very, um, you know, focused on one thing, and it doesn't really highlight some of the other characteristics of another human being. We don't want to tell a person with an eating disorder just to eat, because as Lori's told you and, and we've shared, it's not just about the food. It's about gaining a sense of control. It's about covering up low self-esteem. It's about trying to be perfect at everything that they do, including the way that they're managing their food. So we don't wanna do that. We don't wanna tell somebody that they don't look like they have an eating disorder because I hope from this um, presentation, we recognize it's just not what's on the outside and visible to the naked eye. It's what's going on internally, feeling out of control, feeling disgust, feeling shame. So we wanna be open to recognizing that anyone can be suffering from an eating disorder. We, won't, we don't want to expect that this is going to go away with time. As I just said, many people who are middle-aged and older are suffering from an eating disorder and have been for decades. So we just don't want to think that way. We don't want to delay that when we see someone with an early onset of eating disorder symptoms, like Lori was talking about, that we don't want to ignore those and just kind of blow those off. And I think what's been happening, and Lori's mentioned this, that during COVID and during this cooped up time, we are becoming more heightenedly aware of what our loved ones are doing, but we don't want to just overlook those as boredom or depression or things like that. It could be something much more serious. We don't ever want to threaten somebody with treatment. I get this all the time. I work with young teens and families and parents want me to force them into treatment. And while we want to make sure that someone is medically safe, um, you can do that through going to your doctor or your, at the hospital or going to the ER or something like that. We don't want to force somebody into treatment. So we want to work collaboratively collaboratively with someone, sorry, um, so that they are more um, apt to go through the whole cycle of treatment and then come out on the other side ready and willing to continue their recovery. And we don't want to tell somebody with an eating disorder that once they are um, in recovery that they look healthy or look better because all they're going to hear is that I looked bad or I looked fat. So we, again, I think this is something I stress a lot, especially um, with my families. There are so many attributes that someone holds other than the way that they look, the way that they are shaped. So we want to highlight those things and compliment them on those things. Next slide. So we are wrapping up our presentation here and um, we're definitely gonna open up for any questions that you guys may have. Uh, we really wanna reinforce that we are here. Um, you know, our mission is to help educate communities and to fight against eating disorders and save lives. So we have many referral um, partners and resources that we can help assist you with. Also looking at eating disorders really do require a very specialized treatment team. So you would want to be very cautious of who you're going to be working with if you are seeking out treatment. Um, we can kind of give you tips and feedback on that as well, but really looking for somebody that actually is specialized in eating disorder treatment. Um, I've kind of equated this to some of my clients, you know, if they're going to see say a physician or a psychiatrist that doesn't treat eating disorders, it's kind of like, well, I have, you know, an oncology diagnosis and I'm going to go see the podiatrist. Like it, it doesn't fit. Um, it's really making sure that you find somebody that, that is specialized. 
and really knowing that you're in a position to, to help identify and to, um, to help families as well. So we know by being here, there's, there's some interest in educating yourself or maybe concern for a loved one. And we hope to be able to hear, to be here to assist you with that. So at any point, if you guys have questions, we'd like to go ahead and, and open that up or for discussion topics.